Hi, welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the major theories that form the foundation for human development as an area of scientific study. This material will correspond to what's in Chapter 1 in your textbook. That Chapter 1 link is also found in Unit 1 on Blackboard. So human development really has formed uh, as an area of study pretty recently. So in the last 50 years or so, really human development has come out as an area of scientific study. And it really has taken information from a huge variety of areas, including psychology, biology, philosophy, and many other areas of research. So let's go ahead and get started. In all of our lectures, what you're gonna find is that the first slide that I cover will talk about the major learning outcomes I have for you in this lecture. Today, these will include describing the fundamental issues of human development, creating a model that helps to describe the stages of human development, and lastly, reviewing the major theories and research methods that are relevant for human development. Let's go ahead and get started by talking about the fundamental issues that are critical for people that study human development. Human development really consists of three major areas that define it. First, people that study human development examine how and why people change over time. They want to know how is it that someone goes from being an infant who's barely able to talk or feed themselves, that can't move at all, to a fully functioning adult. We also want to know how and why people are both unique and similar. In what ways do people change in similar patterns over time? Why do many babies in the U.S. tend to walk around a year of age, for example? And in what cases are infants or humans different from one another, and what makes that happen, right? What makes us unique? For example, why is it that babies in other cultures sometimes don't walk until as late as 24 months of age? Um, and does that have any long-lasting effects on the motor development, for example? Really, human development is a multidisciplinary science. As I said just a few minutes ago, that human development as a field of study really has only evolved in the last 50 or so years. Um, before that, it was sort of a disparate set of various sciences. Uh, people were studying human development in biology and in ethology, the study of how animals behave. Uh, they were studying development in psychology. Uh, Freud, you may be familiar with Sigmund Freud, um, proposed multiple theories about how humans develop early in life and how that affects their later psychological development. Um, but it really was all those fields coalescing and really focusing on change over time or development that really led to the defining human development as a field separate from other fields. In general, there are three reoccurring questions that happen in the study of human development. First, and this one you've probably heard about because it's probably the one that's most commonly talked about outside of human development, which is this idea of nature and nurture, right? What makes us who we are? Um, are we fully functioning human adults because of the genes and other biological material we've inherited from our parents? That's sort of the nature side. Or are we the way we are because we've been nurtured that way? The environment, both chemicals we've been exposed to, early experiences we had, how much encouragement we got from parents, to radiation you were exposed to as an adult, any number of environmental factors, right? Does that make you who you are? And again, that's sort of the nurture side of it. So we will talk about throughout this course um, the combination of how really it's both of those things that's important. It both starts with the biological foundations like genes, but it also includes, right, those genes interact with the environment you are exposed to, right? A great example of this is how um, genes for uh, skin color interact with your exposure to UV light, right, a nurture, an environmental factor, to give you your current skin complexion, okay? The second major reoccurring question is whether change happens gradually, right, is it sort of slowly building, or is it what uh, psychologists think of as discontinuous? Does it happen all of a sudden? Okay, this is often thought of as the continuity and discontinuity question. Um, it used to be early on in human development, early on in studies of human development, that we thought that a lot of these changes happened sort of all at once. Uh, that for your brain to advance to the next psychological stage, 
you really, you had to be, you had to have a brain that was mature, but you also had to have a set of experiences that allowed that to happen. And I have a good example of this. Um, when my son was probably about two years of age, um, as him as from for many infants, they usually have one word that labels animate objects, right? Things that move. So his label for animate objects when he was two was dog, right? And everything that moved was a dog. Squirrels were dogs, dogs were dogs, um, fish were dogs, and trucks and cars were also dogs. One day, though, I decided to test it. So he pointed at a truck and he said, dog. And I said, truck. And he looked at me with confusion in his eyes and I said, and he said, dog. And I said, no, truck. And he looked at me totally bewildered and he said, he looked at it and he said, truck. And then I started clapping and I got excited, right? And it was, for him, it really took, you might think of it as having all these things having to happen, having vocal ability, having a way to think about the world that some things may be animate but in different ways, right? That living creatures might be different from um, cars and trucks that allowed him to make that change. That might be an example of a discontinuous change. We'll come back to this again multiple times in the course, um, really looking at in what ways are we continuous and what ways do we change discontinuously. Okay, and the last one are whether the changes that we go through are universal. So if you look across cultures, across genders, across individuals, does everyone change in a similar way? Or are the ways that we change really dependent on the culture, the subculture, and the kinds of experience that we have that shape our development? Here's an interesting example, right? It used to be that we generally thought boys and girls were different biologically at a very young age, and that led to some of the gender roles, right? Um, men were genetically made to be hunters and gatherers. Women were genetically made to be caretakers, right? More and more evidence really has taken that theory apart. Men can be just as efficient as caretakers. Um, women can be just as efficient workers as hunters and gatherers. Um, but unfortunately, we still hold on to some of those old theories, right? That maybe a lot of the things that we see are universal about gender, and that really it's the culture that you're raised in, right, that determines whether or not you're going to be um, a caregiver and an effective parent, and or whether you um, want to be sort of working outside the home. Um, and nothing says those have to be mutually exclusive, right? Um, so maybe you could be both. Okay, again, we'll come across those multiple times in this course, looking at whether human behavior is universal and same across cultures, or in what ways it actually is dependent on the context, the culture that you're raised in. The next thing I want you to do, I want you to think about the life stages, the major life stages that people go through, okay? So I want you to pause the video here and I want you to answer these three things. Diagram for me, what are the major life stages? Um, there's no minimum or maximum that it has to be, but what goes into each of those stages? What are the age boundaries that define that stage, okay? And what are the important events that signal the end of that stage and the onset of another stage? And I'll start you off. The first stage might be the prenatal period. This would be from about 38 weeks prior to birth until birth itself, right? Or you might think of it as going from conception until birth. Some of the major milestones, and there's no right or wrong answer here, might be things like the sperm and the egg coming together, movement in the womb, right? The infant move, fetus moving for the first time, functioning organs, um, the heart beating, for example, and then it might end with the birth of the child. So take a few minutes, diagram out for me what other periods in your life exist, and you should go all the way through death, and then we'll compare them. So what did you come up with? Did you have infancy from zero to one? Then maybe you had the toddler years from one to three, or maybe you actually included those ages from zero to three altogether as infancy and early childhood. Either one of those is great, what were the milestones that you put there? Did you include walking, crawling, talking for the first time? How about being able to identify their parents or having separation anxiety? What came after that? Did you have the preschool years from three to five? Or maybe you included all of those as school years and they went from 
3 to around 11 or 12. What, what major events did you have in there? Going to school for the first time, being left on their own with a stranger might be in there, or with a teacher. Uh, maybe you had the first time they had to do a test, knowing their alphabet, being able to count to 10, knowing their multiplication tables, making friends, being able to tell you who their friends are. There could be a huge number of events that happened in there. Then you might have adolescence, or maybe you divided it up into multiple stages where you had pre-adolescence, and then you had adolescence itself, maybe ending somewhere between 18 to 20. What are the major life stages you had there? I'm sure you had graduation from high school, I'm sure you had puberty, learning to drive, um, maybe you had um, moving out of their parents' house or going to college or getting a full-time job. What comes after that? Early adulthood? What are the major events that define that? What about middle adulthood? Late adulthood? During this course, we're going to talk about all of those major milestones. We're going to talk about what makes them milestones. And we'll probably include some that you didn't even talk about. For now, let's shift to talk a little bit about the research methods and the theories that help to form the foundation for human development. So first, I realize that some of you don't necessarily think of this as a science class, um, but really all sciences, whether they're social sciences, life sciences, physical sciences, rely on theories to help them advance. Theories are really defined as an organized set of ideas that help to explain observations in the real world. Right? They should help us to make sense of the things we perceive around us. They are essential for developing predictions about people's behavior. Right? We want to know, how do we know whether or not an adolescent is going to rebel against their parents? What kinds of things make rebellion more likely? What kinds of things help children relax when they're infants? Right? What can parents do to help nurture and soothe their infants? I bet you probably have ideas about what's most effective. Next, those predictions should result in research data that helps to either support or clarify that theory. There are many theories that we used to have that we no longer follow because data did not support them. A great example is Sigmund Freud's theory about the Oedipus complex. Sigmund Freud believed that males are jealous of their father and want the attention of their mother, just like the story of Oedipus Rex. If you're not familiar with the story of Oedipus Rex, please go to Wikipedia and look it up. It is dark and twisted, as you might hope. Um, so Freud believed that, in fact, this Oedipus complex was happening in human males at a very unconscious level. So they're not aware that this is happening, but that they want the attention and support of their mother, and they want to drive out their father. Data doesn't really support this, um, but the advantage of having a theory like that is that it can be falsifiable, right? We can go out and test it and say, no, data did not support this theory, so now we need to generate alternative explanations, for example, why children get jealous um, when their parents aren't giving them attention, right? Fascinatingly enough, there's actually a recent study looking at jealousy in dogs towards their owners, so that if um, two owners spend time together, right, they hug, they get close, dogs will actually put themselves in between their owners, which has sort of been used as a way to explain something like jealousy in dogs. I don't know whether or not it's actual jealousy, right? There's probably some human components of jealousy, the feelings, the internal feelings that go along with it that we'll never be able to measure in dogs, but that we believe might happen in humans. So let's start with the largest theory of psychosocial development. Eric Erickson was a psychologist working in the 1950s who proposed that changes happen throughout the lifespan in humans. Most theories before Eric's, Eric Erickson's had suggested that most of the important changes that happen psychologically stop by adolescence. Freud and most other people who worked on human development believe that all the important things that happen to you happen in the first 10 to 11 years of your life. More and more with work by Erickson and others, we recognize that there are important changes that happen throughout your lifespan, which has really been a huge change in the field and really drove human development to become a field of its own. Erickson proposed these eight stages. I'll let you read more about them in the book, and we will actually hit them in multiple chapters throughout the course. This should be your general framework for how you think about a lot of the things that we talk about when it comes to psychosocial development, so psychological and social development in kids.
From birth to one year of age, Erickson believed that first infants determine whether or not they can trust their parents. When they cry, are their parents going to come and get them? Otherwise, they become fearful and mistrustful, and they worry that their parents are always going to leave them. Erickson's theory has been supported by data that shows that parents who let their children cry it out actually become anxious in adult relationships. They're scared their partner's going to leave them. They're worried that their partner doesn't love them. Um, more and more data, actually, starting in the 1960s, has shown that parents who are nurturing and supportive and pick up their children when they cry get infants who are more well-adjusted as adults. Then, from one to three years of age, Erickson proposed that children are really learning whether they can do things on their own, or do they have to worry or feel shameful that they're not going to be successful. So this is where children try things on their own and see if they can succeed. My daughter, for example, loves to pour her own milk in her cereal when she was really young. There were two ways I could have handled this. I could have either told her, no, you're going to make a big mess if you do that, or I let her pour. And if she makes a mess, I just ask her to clean it up, right? Because learning to pour both requires some psychomotor coordination, some muscle control, but it also is a psychological task, right? She's learning to say, can I try this? And if I fail, can I try again, okay? From three to six years, this is where children learn to do things on their own. Can they take initiative? Can they come up with goals that they set for themselves? Can they be independent from their parents? Then at six years of age, it's whether or not they can work on tasks and be a gainful member of society. That's the industry stage from six years till adolescence, right? This is where kids start working a lot on homework. They start to participate more with others. Or are they not as good as others, right? So lots of self-esteem issues start to develop at this age, according to Erickson. In adolescence is the search for identity. Who am I? What do I want from my life? What are my goals? What's my place in this world? Versus identity confusion, right? Not knowing what you want to do, being stuck, or an identity moratorium, as we'll talk about later. In young adulthood, it's the search for intimacy and personal relationships. In middle adulthood, it's whether or not you've generated something that's lasting in the world. Do you've you had a lasting impact with your family or at your job? or in other parts of your community that you participate in. In late life is the idea to bring everything together. Have you wrapped up your life? This ego integrity stage is can you make sense of all the things you've done in your life? Um, do you, are there any regrets you have? And if you have regrets, how do you go about fixing those regrets? Or are you sad and despairing because you don't really see anything that came out of your life? Again, we'll talk about all these stages in more detail in the next 17 weeks. Another theory um, that some of you who have taken Psych 1 have probably heard about is operant conditioning. This forms part of, the, part of what we call learning theory. Operant conditioning suggests that the consequences that determine your behavior will, be, will cause it, that behavior to be repeated or not. So if I reinforce your behavior, right, if I give you hugs or praise or candy whenever you do something that I want, then that's going to increase that behavior. So every time my daughter cleans her room, she gets a star, she gets some allowance, and she gets lots of cheering. That hopefully will help her to learn to clean her room even after she moves out um, without needing me to come and give her money or cheer or gold stars. Think about whether you still clean your room. But there's also punishment, right? Punishment should, according to the theory, be used to decrease a behavior. So when my children misbehave, I duct tape them to the wall. That'll teach him. No, I don't actually. Please don't report me. Um, this is not my child. This is just a picture from the internet. But um, B.F. Skinner and others who worked on learning theory actually did not like the idea of punishment because it never teaches a child what they should be doing. All it does is teach them what they shouldn't be doing. In fact, they would always encourage reinforcement, right, because then that rewards the behaviors that you want um, without some of the detrimental effects of punishment, as we'll talk about later in the course. There's also social learning theory where people learn by watching others, right? It doesn't have to be that you actually get some consequence, either a reward or a punishment, to end a behavior or to increase a behavior. You can just learn by watching your siblings, right? As some of you probably did, you learned what to do or maybe what not to do, or maybe you learned at least how not to get caught by watching your siblings. Social learning is more likely when you are observing someone that you hold in high esteem, someone who's smart, someone who's popular, someone who's talented. For those of you that have older siblings, maybe for a time at least you looked up to them. I know that my daughter looks up to her brother, even though they don't always get along. She really does hold him in high esteem and often tries to mimic a lot of the things that he does. 
Another theory is cognitive developmental theory. In cognitive developmental theory, these really stress the development of thought processes in children. Previous theories, like learning theory, before the 1950s and 60s, really had focused on observable behaviors rather than on thought processes, because most psychologists were not, uh, many psychologists at least, were not interested in measuring uh, thought processes because they didn't think they could be easily measured. So they wanted to focus on observable behaviors, right? What you're actually doing. Are you actually doing your homework rather than are you thinking about your homework, right? So these cognitive developmental theories, which generally include three various approaches, one popularized by Jean Piaget, which we'll talk about, who proposed that we develop in discrete stages. Another one um, founded by Lev Vygotsky, which says that the so societal expectations of what you should know really shape your development. So society really teaches you how to be and what you're supposed to learn. And then lastly, one that came out of computer programming and computer information theory, which says that we really become more efficient at processing information as we mature. As I'm sure you recognize, you are much more efficient at studying than you were when you were younger because you really didn't know how to organize your studying. Six-year-olds don't know how to study for spelling tests because they don't have some of the cognitive skills they need to learn how to organize their studying. Hopefully, you're beyond that point, but we'll see during the semester. The last theory we're going to talk about is Braun Fenbrenner's ecological approach. Um, he proposed in a book in 1979 that all of how we develop really is impacted in a larger system and these systems are embedded in other systems. Um, there are, in the most current version of the theory, there are actually five levels, but we're only going to look at the more common four levels that most people talk about. Okay? The microsystem is your immediate environment that impacts you. It's your family, your friends, the people you see on a daily basis or on a frequent basis that shape how you think about the world, your friendships, and how you generally function. But outside of that is a mesosystem. The mesosystem are the interactions that may not directly affect you, but maybe they have an indirect effect. So these could be things like um, how your parents interact with one another, right, whether they get along or not, may impact how you do and how you look at modeling of your own relationships as an adult. Okay. Then there are exosystems. These are some of the indirect effects, maybe whether or not your parents get in trouble at work, causes them to have a bad day, which then they take out on you, that would be an exosystem, right? So your parents' work environment is indirectly affecting your own personal environment. But it could also be things like politics, media, any number of other sources that sort of have trickle-down effects on your own functioning. And then lastly, who you are is also a product of all the culture and subcultures you've been raised in. My children are often encouraged to try to break gender roles as frequent as possible because I want them to live in a world where they see androgynous behavior, that you can be or act however you want to be without having to be forced into some gender role that is not of your making, right? My daughter doesn't have to wear pink if she doesn't want to. My son can go to a Halloween costume in a dress if he wants to. Those should all be acceptable in my world, right? But that doesn't always, that's not always the case, right? Your culture really shapes how you see the world and what you see as acceptable gender roles. Those would be macro systems. So the last part of this lecture is going to be on research design. There are a few things we're going to talk about. I know that for some of you this is probably a new area, so we'll go, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about this. Let's start by talking about non-experimental or what are some kinds called correlational studies. Non-experimental or correlational studies measure how two variables relate to one another. Knowing how these studies happen will be important for you being able to read scientific findings that you find in newspaper articles and other sources and trying to make sense of them. There are two kinds of correlations that you might find in non-experimental studies. There are positive correlations. These happen when two variables change in the same direction. So for example, we know that your score on an SAT test maybe you took an SAT test, is positively correlated, right? As your SAT score goes up, it's positively correlated with your GPA, right? So people that tend to get higher SAT scores also tend to have higher GPAs. But there's also a negative correlation. So negative correlations happen when variables change in opposite directions. For example, um, the more you drink the night before an exam, the lower your exam score, right? That might be a hypothetical negative correlation.
The more alcohol you consume, the lower your exam score. They're going in opposite directions. In general, we measure correlations by using a correlation coefficient, sometimes labeled with a lowercase r. These correlation coefficients can range from zero. If it's zero, that means there's no correlation at all. The two variables do not change in any noticeable direction. But they can range all the way up to 1.0. So a 1.0 would say that those scores are more strongly predictive. So the higher the magnitude, the closer to one, that shows you how much the scores on one variable predict the other variable's scores. Um, another example you might think of is um, the effect of hours of sunlight or amount of sunlight on your mood, right? So that might be a correlation that you think exists. Let's do another one though, because correlational studies are very commonly reported in newspapers, but there's a problem with correlational studies, and I'm going to illustrate it with an example. This is from Tyler Viggins' website and book looking at uh, correlations. The problem with correlations is that just because you see that two variables are related does not mean that those two variables, that one causes a change in the other. Here's one example. This is the amount of U.S. spending on science, space, and technology going from 1999 here all the way through 2009. Okay, so U.S. spending going from $15 billion up to $30 billion on science, space, and technology. And then, these are the number of suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation, also between 1999 to 2009. What you can see here is that these variables are tightly connected, right? The more we spend on science, and education, uh, science, space, and technology, the more suicides. The correlation, actually, the R is 0.99. That's as close to one, almost as close to one as you could get. This doesn't mean, though, that we should stop spending money on science, space, and technology because it's causing more people to commit suicide, right? That would be a ridiculous correlation, as is the correlation between diet soda and heart attack risk, right? You might imagine, oh, diet beverages, they have chemicals in them that cause heart attacks, except for there's an equally plausible alternative explanation and I want you to always be thinking of alternative explanations. So think about it for a second. Why would someone who consumes high amounts of diet sodas have a higher heart attack risk? Because maybe they're not just consuming high amounts of soda. They're probably consuming other things, foods that are high in fat. Maybe they're not getting much exercise. There are any number of other explanations. If we really want to know whether or not there's a causal relationship, whether one variable causes a change in the other, then we need to use what's called an experimental study. In an experimental study, these are actually trying to measure the causal variable and see if that causal variable has an effect on another variable. The two kinds of variables that we see in experimental studies are independent variables, sometimes abbreviated IV. The independent variable is the causal variable that is manipulated by the researcher. We think the independent variable causes a change in the dependent variable, sometimes abbreviated DV. So the dependent variable is thought to change based on changes in the independent variable. And the researcher in an experimental study should try to control all other extraneous variables. So earlier I mentioned the link between sunlight levels and mood. If I believe that the amount of sunlight has a causal effect, it actually changes your mood then I would need to control other things. I need to control things like time of year. I need to control whether or not you had a bad day or got a bad grade. I need to control whether or not you had a good day, right? I need to take a group of people. I need to lock them in a lab somewhere. I need to have a skylight that gives them a standard amount of sunlight. And then I need to put them in a boring standardized environment so that other things don't affect their mood. I need to vary sunlight levels using a sun lamp or natural sunlight, and then I need to see if that actually does have a measurable effect on their mood. But the problem is, it might be a placebo effect, right? Because you notice when there's more sunlight. So maybe you've just convinced yourself that there is some effect that actually is all in your head. Placebo effects have very powerful impacts on human behavior. The effects of placebos on pain control are as powerful as morphine. So we can convince people that they're getting pain relief when in fact they're getting nothing but a sugar tablet and it will replace morphine. They think they're getting morphine, but in fact they're getting nothing at all. This is how powerful some of those placebo effects can be.
So be cautious about assuming causal relationships between variables without some sort of experimental study. Another kind of study that you'll see in lifespan development are cross-sectional studies, right? If we're going to measure development, we want to know whether or not people change over time. Well, the easiest way to do that, the cheapest way to do that, is with a cross-sectional study. This is where we take multiple groups of people at different ages, and at one time, we measure all of them. In the example that you'll see here, I want to know whether or not there are effects of September 11th, 2001, on babies who are living in New York City. So I'm going to take two groups in 2010. I'm going to measure them. I'm going to measure babies who were 10 years old in 2010. And then I'm going to measure babies who are four years old who were not exposed to the September 11th, 2001 attacks. So that would tell me, right, I can look at four-year-olds and I can look at ten-year-olds. The four-year-olds luckily were never exposed, hopefully, to any direct effects of September 11th, whereas the ten-year-olds were. They were one-year-old when it happened. But you might, you can probably see right now, the problem is, is that you're comparing a ten-year-old and a four-year-old, and they're different in many ways. So that may not necessarily always be the best comparison. So there's an alternative study right? That is a longitudinal study. In a longitudinal study, I take one group of people, so I'm going to take people who were born in 2000, so they were one when September 11th happened, and I'm going to measure them across time to see if there is a psychological effect, at least within the first 10 years after September 11th, and then see if maybe that effect wanes as they get older. The problem with longitudinal studies is that they're expensive, they require lots of time, and you might lose participants over time. They move away, they don't want to participate in the study anymore, but the advantage is in that one group of people, I have their previous set of data so I can see if there's been any change over time. But again, these are pretty expensive to do. They're not always realistic to happen. It, if, for the example like September 11th, it would have been great if we could measure their psychological functioning before, maybe when they were six months old, so before September 11th happened. Um, that would also make this a stronger study. Well, we actually could combine both of these methods. We call that a sequential study. In a sequential study, I take multiple cohorts. So in this, I'm going to take people who were born in 2006 and people who were born in 2000. And I'm going to measure them actually across from 2010, 2016, and 2022. I'm going to measure them at four years of age in this first group, 10 years of age, and 16 years of age. So in this way, right, I both have, I have two longitudinal studies, right, I'm looking at kids who were not exposed to September 11, 2001, um, and measuring them at four, 10, and 16. And then I have my kids who were exposed to September 11, 2001, at 10, 16, and 22. Now, I can compare these two groups when they're both 10 years of age, okay? and I can compare them when they're 16 years of age. So I get rid of any sort of cohort effect, right? I can see, okay, are these 16-year-olds similar in both ways? If they're different, that suggests that something happened because of September 11, 2001, or that there is some other difference between those two groups of people. And then I can see if those effects are consistent over time, right? Is this group down here that was born in 2000, do the, are they more fearful? Do they worry more about terrorism? Um, when they're, let's say, 10 or 16, then this group up here. Um, are there other effects that maybe they're afraid of flying this group down here, whereas this group is not? Um, you can identify and measure many variables. Most critically, though, if we're going to do research, we need to make sure that we are conducting ethical research. Because of events in Nazi Germany and during World War II, we have developed a set of standards that help us to minimize risks to participants. We need to warn our participants if there might be any risks. Participants who volunteer to participate in studies must give their informed consent. They must know what you're trying to measure, what variables you might be manipulating, if you're going to give them medication, what kinds of medication. You can rarely, if ever, lie to them or deceive your participants. So they need to be able to 
give informed consent, and if you deceive them, they cannot give informed consent. And lastly, all of their data must be anonymous or confidential. You cannot identify those participants. You cannot give that data away to individuals with any identifying information. The goal of research is to help us to understand humans, but not when it harms other people. That ends this lecture for today. Email me with any questions.